Good morning, everyone. With COVID-19 case numbers continuing to rise, healthcare workers, officials, and are doing whatever it takes to keep workers safe. Patients at uh, Baptist Memorial Group, or whether well, Baptist Memorial Group, pardon me, started a drive-through testing site for people who are having symptoms. Our Desmond Matthews has more on that. The surge in the Delta variant of COVID-19 is causing a comeback of sorts. After months focused on vaccinations, many medical centers find themselves returning to mass testing. Regional operator of the Baptist Memorial Group, Wesley Wallace, says he and the team saw this rise and wanted to take some of the load off of their colleagues. As we were trying to decompress our emergency room, um, we were seeing record numbers of patients coming in and long wait times. So to serve the public better and faster, um, we decided to open up a, a COVID-19 testing facility. The drive through site is open Monday through Friday from 8 until 4, but people do have to pre-register and things have already been busy. We've seen some pretty good numbers. We're, we're averaging between 30 and 100 patients a day coming through the drive through testing facility. Once a patient pre-registers by calling the number, they'll come to the drive through testing site, get swabbed and be on their way as they await their results. Two nurses will be out each day to test the patients, but if traffic gets heavy, they'll add more to keep things moving. The group had been testing people before moving outside, but felt this was a better way to help everyone. This was already in place. We were just doing it inside the clinics and inside the ER. And to reduce those wait times, we just moved it outside so the patients wouldn't have to get out of their car. In Columbus, Desmond Matthews, WCBI News. And Wallace encourages anyone who thinks they may have symptoms to come get tested rather than potentially spreading the virus further. Well, as more students across the country return to the classroom, battles in masking over schools continue to rage on. Still, top U.S. health officials say masking is key to keeping students safe. But which masks are best for kids? Mandy Gaither has more. For millions of students and teachers, the beginning of the school year is spelling out chaos with quarantines, temporary closures and moves to remote learning as COVID-19 cases climb. Talking about flying blind relative to children, we need better data and that's got to be the basis for action. Admiral Brett Girard, former coronavirus testing czar under President Donald Trump, says less than half of U.S. states report the number of children hospitalized for COVID-19. Because of that, he says the state reported numbers are unknown in some places where children's hospitals are seeing a rise in cases. We have a raging uh, pandemic and we do know with good data that if children wear masks in school, they can be safe. So which mask is best for your child? A pediatrician says one they will wear. If your child has been wearing a mask that they love for the last year and it still fits them well with that little nasal bridge that you can pinch down and there's no gaps on the sides and it curves under their chin. The CDC says the best masks are those made for children and the fit should be tested regularly to make sure it fits snugly and completely covers the child's nose and mouth with at least two layers of washable, breathable fabric. If you can send a few with your child every day, wash them all at the end of the day, and I think that's sort of a good routine to get in the habit of. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. And a new poll of more than 1,000 U.S. adults shows that nearly 70% of Americans support local school districts requiring everyone to wear a mask when they are in school. Well, here's an opportunity for students to choose a path for learning. Starkville High School is partnering with local businesses and industries to create academic houses. This allows the students to learn by hands-on experiences and through small learning communities. Starkville Utilities is the first to announce their connection with Starkville High. Technology principal Darian Spann says students can focus on their specific interests and that makes school more relevant. Those that desire to go to college, we want to get them there. Those that desire to go straight to the workforce, we want to get them there. And so this is an opportunity to provide that for them, to be able to see what is it that they have an interest in. And if this is an interest for them, this may be an opportunity for them once they graduate high school. Part of the community and look into the future and workforce is a huge factor in where we're going and what we need because things are continuing to change and develop. It's good to see you. The program provides internships, job shadow, site visits and other opportunities to strengthen the connection between classroom instruction and those real world experiences. Startville High is also offering dual enrollment and advanced placement courses. 
All right, if you're in the market for a new car, you may have already noticed the prices for new automobiles are high. They're record high, in fact. According to Kelly Blue Book, the average transaction price for a new automobile hit a record high of nearly $43,000 in July, that was up 8% from last July, a limited supply of new vehicles and a trend toward higher end SUVs and pickup trucks are some of the reasons for the price jump. However, the high prices may be discouraging customers. New car sales have slowed with July being the slowest month of seasonally adjusted sales in one year. Now, when you hear largest retailer, it may surprise you that there has been a shift at the top, or it may not. Amazon has passed Walmart for that title. It's something analysts expected for some time, but more e-commerce during the pandemic pushed Amazon over the top. According to Wall Street estimates compiled by the financial research firm FactSet, Amazon took in more than $610 billion over the past 12 months, while Walmart took in $566 billion. Sears took the title from A&P back in the 1960s, then Walmart claimed it in the 90s, and now begins Amazon's reign. I bet some of you out there got a package from Amazon today, didn't you? All right, a familiar face, a familiar voice. We're talking with our new chief meteorologist next on Mid Morning. We've been here through the years using technology and experience. I've got our own radar, teletype machines, facsimile machines. Through rain and snow and ice. We've had several reports of uh, severe wind damage. When the waters rise and the sun comes out, WCDI weather, the calm in the storm. Eastern Mississippi, West Alabama. A legacy of trust with meteorologists you know. Welcome home, Chief Meteorologist Isaac Williams. So the cat's out of the bag. Isaac Williams is back, our new chief meteorologist, and we're happy to welcome him to the mid-morning table. Yes, I'm back to on my old stomping grounds here. Yes, you know, I remember sitting at this very table years ago. Years it ago. Like. Yes. It was years ago. It was years ago, and we're glad that you're back. Welcome back to the table. Welcome back to WCBI, to North Mississippi and West Alabama. All, All of, of the it. things. Yes. yes, it's been a wild journey, and who would have thought that I would ever get back here, but here we are. I'm excited, relieved, yes. just extremely happy and excited to be here. Well, a lot of our viewers have followed you since you left through yes. social media and other means, but for those who may not, kind of tell us what happened after WCBI. So I left here the first time mm -hmm. to go to South Carolina to mm -hmm. the Fox affiliate there. Wonderful time in Greenville. Mm -hmm. And then I went from there to really deep South Texas, uh -huh. uh, as far South as you can get basically. <laughs> and then, you know, Keith was leaving and mm -hmm. then this opportunity came up and, you know, I just, I never minded being a little bit away from home mm -hmm. uh, in South Carolina, but Texas was 16 hours. It's a long way. Uh, which is home in Tuscaloosa. So mm -hmm. I just decided uh, with other things, that was just a little too much. So so you're back here with uh, the severe weather, the heat, the humidity, and all yes. that comes with living in this part of the yes. country. But you're, you're armed and ready, aren't yes. you? Yes. You know, living here for years, going mm -hmm. to school here, sure. growing up in Alabama, I'm no stranger to severe weather. And South Carolina, we had plenty there too. Didn't get us too much uh, from Texas. Oh, look, there I am from... Way back when, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think you were talking to emergency management people yeah. during a uh, During a briefing, weather. ready for severe weather. There's mm -hmm. Ashley, you know, so many great people have come through here over the years. And yes. uh, we're, we're building, a, rebuilding a, a great team here as well. So I'm mm -hmm. really excited about that too. So that's, it's different to come back. You know, you're coming back home, but you're coming back in a new role. So how yes. does that feel to be back in this role? It's honestly still surreal. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I've always wanted to be a chief meteorologist since day one. Mm -hmm. um, and I got that opportunity until Texas, but oh, wait a minute, I have to oh, <laughs> So the picture we just saw, the guitar. Was, it was a legendary moment. You <laughs> and our former 9 or 10 anchor, Emily Casulo, yes. um, saying, baby, baby it's, baby, cold, it's outside. cold outside. <laughs> and you know, I was recognized not from the weather, but from that particular thing in, in the Walgreens here in Columbus <laughs> way back when. And uh, they're like, we didn't know you could play or sing. And I'm like, well, I don't know if we call that singing, but at least I was playing well, it correctly. You know, you're, you're actually very, very talented <laughs> in both of those things. Well, aside from your role here at the TV station, um, you'll probably be out doing some public speaking and visiting yes. things, but you're also going to be 
helping students the next generation of meteorologists. Yeah, can you believe State. that? You know, uh, somehow or another, Mississippi State <laughs> thinks I'm qualified <laughs> to teach. No, I really am. Uh, I guess uh, I got my master's degree there seven years ago now. Hundreds of lives are at stake. Yes, hundreds of lives are at stake. But uh, you know what? It's it's been just uh, a wild ride there, and mm -hmm. I'm really excited because this time I'm actually getting to teach on campus. Okay. As well as online. I've done online instruction before, but this is the first time I'll Fourth actually State, be right. Yes, mm -hmm. face to face. So. So that's going to be a, you know, I'm used to just talking to a camera right. that reaches thousands of people mm -hmm. instead of actual people. Well, <laughs> you know, they so. will be learning from the best. I so hope so. Parents out there, if you've got kids in the meteorology department, he'll be, you'll yes. be just fine. Yes. So we've got a little less than a minute left. Okay. Your vision for your department going forward. Yeah, just kind of continue the legacy. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had so many great people. You just saw it coming into this yes. uh, yeah. segment. And just to continue the legacy, if we're not on television, you don't need to be concerned. We stay calm, you stay safe, and that's it. That's mm -hmm. as simple as that. And that's what we want. Yes. Welcome home. We're so glad Thank you're you, back. Thank you, Andrea. I really appreciate it. All right. Coming up, words matter. That's why there is a new space dedicated to just that. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. Here's something we don't often tell you about. A museum with no paintings, no statues. It's in Washington, D.C., and Chip Reed is about to take you there. Hello, and welcome to Planet Word. Hello. Yo. Exploring Washington's newest museum, Planet Word, you might think you've entered an amusement park. And in some ways, you have. You're standing in front of about 1,000 words. And that's not even 1% of the entire English language. Underlying everything is a sense of fun. It's a, a museum built on ideas and then turned into experiences. But the fun here is all about making everyone, but especially 10 to 12 year olds and their families, feel the fascination, the inspiration, and the wonder of words and language. I'm Doreen, I'm from Tanzania, and I speak Swahili. And I speak Russian. Hebrew. Navajo. My whole life, I would say, built up to doing something like this and being engaged with words and language. Ann Friedman, a philanthropist who spent 12 years teaching in elementary schools, is Planet Word's founder and CEO. I want people to pay attention to words, the ones they use, the ones they hear, to be more aware of their power, of their beauty. And for Friedman, words are clearly all in the family. She's married to New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman. This is new and original. It makes you want to read yeah, Alice in Wonderland. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. She conceived the idea seven years ago for what she's calling the world's first fully voice activated and immersive yeah. museum. The. How important to what you've done here is the fact that you yourself were a first grade teacher? It certainly helped me think about how to make an activity interactive and hands on and participatory. <laughs> Friedman gave us a tour. So where are we right now? We're in the magical library. Magical indeed, from the mirrored ceiling to the dozens of books that seem to come alive by talking to you. If only one lesson from this book stays with you, let it be this. Salt has a greater impact on flavor than any other ingredient. Have you ever seen a cookbook spring to no, life? No. With sound not, effects? Never. In the library, there's also a hidden door. So this is a secret passageway to poetry. Absolutely, and all different kinds. And a lot of the fun you have with language is in poetry. But the fun doesn't stop there. This is our joking around gallery. Joking around. As we found out in the next gallery. And I'm supposed to try not to laugh. Yeah, dare ya. <laughs> what did the duck say to the bartender? Uh, I'll have a quack. You can put it on my bill. <laughs> I'm you not supposed to, to laugh. You are so these are the original stairs that thousands of school children went up and down. Since 1869. Wow. 
The historic 150-year-old Franklin School was long abandoned and badly decaying when Friedman won the city's OK to restore and rehabilitate it. But putting this massive project together, with 130 tons of steel and 1,200 cubic yards of concrete, was both complicated and a labor of love, spanning two and a half years. These look pretty clean and nice now, the ceramic tiles, but they were covered with a black mastic and we had to find some substance, something that would take that off. And uh, it turned out to be baking soda and water and a lot of elbow grease. Friedman herself, from a family of major shopping center developers, footed all of the building's restoration costs, $35 million. In return, the city awarded her a 99-year lease at $10 a year. She raised another $25 million for startup costs and for all the high-tech exhibits in this 53,000-square-foot museum. What are you most proud of when you walk around this building? Then I rescued the Franklin School, a National Historic Landmark. I, I feel good about everything that I've done here. Feeling good about this longtime Washington symbol of education, now fully refreshed and reopened, inspiring all visitors about the power of language, oh dear. reading, oh dear. I shall be late. and words. And beyond. That's one small seize the day. All right, coming up, save those drawings. Your child's doodles may be worth more than sentiment. We'll show you ahead on mid-morning. All right, welcome back. It was the ride of a lifetime. A father and son, single-minded in their goal. Nikki Batiste caught up with them as they reached the finish line. So the border to New York. That's right. Shepard Culver had dreamed of seeing the Statue of Liberty for 3,300 miles, pedaling every single one of them. It took 18 weeks, but he made it. What do you think of the Statue of Liberty right there? Was it <laughs> worth it? It was definitely worth it, yeah, it's pretty cool. He'd convinced his dad, James, to make the trip, starting from their home in Washington state and across all of America, even though Shepard is only nine years old. Are your legs tired? You know, I'm a kid, I got a lot of energy. Uh, they don't hurt as bad as my dad do when we're done. That's true. They started this adventure in 2019, but had to stop when Shep kept getting headaches and was diagnosed with diabetes. <laughs> but nothing stopped them this time. Dad, how was the journey for you? It was a wonderful bonding experience. I feel like I invested my time as his dad really well here. Would you rather be going back to school or still riding your bike with your dad? Still riding. Shepard is home now, reunited with his mom yesterday, but he's still riding high from his summer with dad. Sparkling cider. <laughs> Nikki Batiste, CBS News, New York. Ten-year-old Joe Whale loves to doodle on any blank page he can. He's even gotten in trouble with his teachers for it, but while others saw a habit, his parents saw a talent. And now he's got thousands of fans. Here's Ian Lee. For Joe Whale, these aren't merely doodles. It's his imagination coming to life. What's your favorite thing to doodle? I like doodling food, robots, and aliens. The 10-year-old discovered his passion for drawing in a familiar place. Your math book turned into? A doodle book. <laughs> But you might guess his teacher didn't take too kindly to this. You're doodling at school, and the teacher yeah. says there's no doodling at school. Yeah. How, how'd that feel? Well, it made me feel quite annoying because um, there was no place that I'd really be able to express myself. So Joe's parents, Greg and Vanessa, decided something must be done. We thought we'd just get him into some after-school art class. Those art classes soon led to Joe's first big commission, a wall at a local restaurant. I was really excited because it was the first time I could actually express myself and pretend that my characters were coming to life. The wall was a hit and requests, well, they started to roll in for more doodles. And his Instagram account, it hit over 19,000 followers in just a few days. 
it's just overwhelming so we have to shield him from that um, and Joe has no idea um, at the scale of what it's turned into um, so we're just protecting him as much as we can from that so he can just enjoy drawing. While Joe's parents manage his future, he has his own vision. What do you want to be when you grow up? Definitely an artist. It sounds like you really want to make your art so people can enjoy it. Yeah. This is that famous wall, and what's pretty incredible is that there has to be hundreds of doodles here, but not one is similar. My personal favorite is this one, how to draw not just a dog, but a cool dog. And you better believe that I will be practicing that later. Ian Lee, CBS News, Shrewsbury, England. We'll be right back to wrap things up. Stay with us. All right, be sure you stay connected with us. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We love to hear from you. See you back here next time.